Hey, my name is Sean Booth. I'm the pastor here at Open Arms Church. We're so glad that you've clicked on this video. Uh, you know, our mission is to see people experience life change through Jesus Christ. And so I, I really pray that this inspires you. It encourages you that you enjoy. Hey, we'd love for you just to, to like and subscribe. That helps us to get the word out. But I really hope that this blesses you today. Enjoy. So today, as you all guys know, we're in Daniel, right? We're in Daniel 6 today. Big chapter, right? Daniel 6. The lion's den. We kind of, we, we probably all know the story. Most of us do, um, but we want to keep it fresh. We want to keep it relevant, and I want you guys to be able to maybe catch something new in it. In it, um, and so as we said, the series is against the flow that we've been going through for weeks, um, and it's really a challenge. Just like Daniel, who was in in Babylon, in a in a different place with a king who, who, who didn't agree with his practices. Uh, he was in a place where everyone was doing different things and he was given the task to be faithful in exile, to be faithful in a place where it was difficult to be faithful. And there's so much in it. I'm uh, sure the week just studying this chapter, I was blown away. I was like, this is phenomenal. And just so encouraged by Daniel's life. How, how can we do it? How can we be faithful? How can we, how can we live the life that he did? Um, and I believe he's given us some, some, some really special tools, particularly in this chapter, uh, where we can look at it and just see this is the secret. If you want to be faithful here, this is the secret. If you want to be able to live a life set apart for him, this is the secret. And so I'm really, really encouraged to share, you, uh, share this with you guys. Uh, so in Daniel 6, just to give you a bit of context, a bit of, of, of to, to understand where we're at in this, so we're at this point now where Daniel, we always think when we see Daniel in the lion's den, he's like in the kids' books, right? The kind of cute little kid. Right? He's like an 80-year-old man at this point, okay? Within the context, he's this 80-year-old man. He's been working and he's been, he's been in, in the government. He's been leading things for a long time. And we get to this point now where there's the King Darius, this new king in charge, and he's shaking things up a bit. He's changed in the way things are done, and he has seen Daniel's faithfulness, his ability, everything that Daniel has been able to do, and he is like, I'm, I'm setting you up. I'm putting you up on a higher bar. I'm putting you up on another level of influence. And so, you know, things are going great. You know, we think that Daniel is up here. But unfortunately, and many of us know, when we kind of take a step higher, we try to get people, you know, people drag us down, right? People try to pull you down. When we get to this place, it's always this push down. And so we get to, to, to verse 4 and 5, uh, and we see that these, these administrators, these other guys are hatching a plan. They're hatching a plan to get at him, to get Daniel. They're sick of him. He's too good. Do we know those guys? I can be honest, right? You know, we love to be Daniel in this situation, right? Well, we love being Daniel. Oh, I'm doing so great, and those other guys are pulling me down. But what about when the other guy is up on top? What do we think? Yeah, that one caught me when I was when I was doing this. But so, verse four and five. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. I oh, love this. He was faithful always responsible and completely trustworthy. So they concluded our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. I love that. They couldn't find anything in him. The man was clean. He had nothing. And so when he can't find anything, they come after the source of his success, right? They come after the thing that was the source of where his power, where his ability, where his promotion, it all came from, his, his time with Jesus. And so they come after the source. They come after the thing that gave him his power. And, you know, in this, I just, as we look at it and we see it and we see Daniel's life above reproach, as I said, he is 80 and they had nothing on him. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. Don't we hear sometimes a lot of sad news stories? Yeah. Oh, he was found out. Oh, well, that was exposed. Well, he was caught out. They actively searched and searched for anything on Daniel. And in 80 years, they couldn't find a thing. Not a thing. Wow, I want to be like that. I want us all to be like that, just, just above reproach. It's phenomenal. It is phenomenal. You know, and, and, and when I look at this and I think about Daniel, can I be honest? If Daniel was an Irish man, and I'm going to rat out some of us Irish people right here, because I'm going to explain some cultural things. If Daniel was Irish, he would never, ever, ever have gotten himself in this situation. Not a chance. Not a chance. 
As, as an Irishman, I can testify that the biggest fear within a lot of Irish people is that you're going to be, you're going to be brought to this level and that people are going to start gossiping about you and say, oh, should look at him. Doesn't he think he's better than he is? Oh, sure. He has notions, that lad. Oh, sure. You know, you know, and sure, do you know where he came from? Sure, he's only down. That's what they do, right? That's our biggest fear. And so, you know, when, when people come to Ireland and they ask about the Irish people and they're around them for a little while, people think the Irish people are half depressed. Uh, honestly, they're like, oh, well, they're half depressed apart from a Friday, Saturday night. Then they're lovely. You know, they're great. You know, that's the kind of plan. But I'm telling you, Irish people, they're not half depressed. They're just cagey. They're cagey, right? And so this is what happens. It's that because we don't want to experience this very thing, when other people will say, how are you doing? I'm doing amazing. I'm doing awesome. These things are super. I'm great. Life is going great. An Irish person will say, I'm not too bad. <laughs> or they'll say, sure, could be worse. <laughs> and I mean, if they've had a phenomenal day, things were grand. Right? I mean, that's like the tippy top. Because we're afraid. We're really afraid. Because if I tell you that things are going good, you might take that thing from me. You might take my goodness away from me, so I have to keep it close to my chest in case. In case, right? And so what I'm saying is that, as especially within an Irish context, this was a real struggle for me, because I hate being on the platform. I hate being the person who has to step up. I hate to have to be the person who has to stand up and maybe face ridicule. In school, we would always... Do you know, in our school, the greatest honor among our friends was if you didn't do your homework. Have you, done your t- oh, have you studied for this test? Oh, jeez, no, I should look, not much. You know, I looked at a few pages. You could have been spending six weeks studying and wor- you know, working for 10 hours, but you're never going to tell the lads that, right? I should have hardly looked at the books, like, you know? Because you want to be with the guys. You want to be, you know, you want to be cool. You want to stay low because it's safe. People up here got could, so we're going to stay low. And so even in this, I think there's a massive challenge for us to be like, am I willing for the sake of God, to stand up and be like, I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to be honest and I'm going to be joyful and I'm going to respond and be like, things are going good. That God has been really faithful in my life and actually allow our lives to be a testimony rather than just being one of the crowd. Yeah. Just stand up and be like, cool. And you know, can I make a confession about how I would nod above reproach in my workplace? Here, guys, a few coughs, you know. <laughs> You're like, oh, oh, yeah, one of these ones. I you know <laughs> uh, no, there was this, I was working in Argos, right? Working in Argos, and uh, also, quick little side note about Argos. Some of you guys have stolen a lot of you know, those little pencils in Argos. You know those? <laughs> Talking about above reproach, I know there was about two or three of those little pencils from Argos in every house in the country. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so back to, back to business. Right, so I was in, Ar- in Argos, and I, had a, I actually really enjoyed it, the season I was working there. But um, in order to be friends and be part of the crowd, what I'd do is, is that when everyone was around me and we got around and having the chats, you know what the chat would always be? Sure, the managers are useless. Oh, sure, they don't know what they're doing, do they? Oh, sure. What do they know? Oh, sure. sure, I don't know why they're in the job at all. Sure, they're useless. Sure, we know better anyway, but sure, look. They obviously had an in with the area manager, and sure, they know it all, you know. And so you, they start criticizing, you're in that culture. And so instead of being like, oh, I actually like the manager, right, you just back off and you just kind of agree with them. And right away, I've just not been above reproach. Because then what happens if someone comes along and they say, oh, we want to promote John, we want to, we want to put him in a place of influence, what are the other guys going to come and say? But sure, that chap was always gossiping and and being mean and saying all these things about the managers. Well, they go and say that. See, already I have something that I'm trying to hide from someone else. I'm not above reproach. And it's really hard to just stand up and actually give way from our fear of man and our fear of popularity and our fear of being one of the guys to just being faithful and being just loyal and being above reproach and everything. It is tough. It is really tough. And so I'm so inspired by Daniel. We need to be more like him. We need to get rid of all of that sort of Irishness and be more like Daniel. And so we get to this point where, where, where he has stood up, they've pulled him down, and they're hatching the plan, and they've come up with a great plan. They've come up with a great plan. So they see the only way I'm going to get him is by getting his religion, is by getting his faith, is by getting to the core, because they know that's the one thing he's not going to give up. He's never going to give up that. And so, so we get to... Um, we get to this point, you know, and, and I, actually just before, I want to backtrack a bit. 
Um, some of us like to run away from the fear and the trouble, and I'm just going to live a quiet life. We, you know, we, we just want that, you know, quiet life and contentment, and all is going to be good, and I'm just going to stay in my little corner. Um, you know, but like the promises of God, you know, we love the promises of God, and you know, like, God, you'll never leave me or forsake me, you'll never give me up, you'll never, you know, you'll be there always. And I love this, this promise in John 16. Yeah. In this life, you'll have trouble. Thanks, Jesus. Oh, that's my favorite one. <laughs> In this life, you'll have trouble. So we can't run away from it. We can't get away from it. And we just need to settle just for a minute. I love to just be the prophet of doom and just say, we're going to have trouble. But Jesus has overcome the world. Yeah. And we can learn how to have, do trouble well. Yeah. We can learn how to do affliction well. We can learn how to do suffering well. We can allow it to be something that's glorious, something that's great, something that is powerful rather than just trouble. Yeah. And there's a difference there. Yeah. And so in this sermon, I want to talk about how we take our trouble that's going to come and make it something that is amazing, make it something that's a place of growth, make it something that's a place of testimony, make it a place of something that, that brings faith in us, make it a place of something that brings joy in us. We want it to become something powerful. And so in this, we see how Daniel took a den of lions, and in it, it became a den of delight. And that's the title of my sermon, is Den of Delight. I want us to experience a den of delight, even in, no matter where we are, in the suffering, in the trial, in whatever. And so we continue on. And so they come up with the plan. The plan is, is that we'll see in verse, verse 7, the royal administrators, the prefects, the satraps, the advisors and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. The ultimatum, the trouble, the test. If you pray you're gone. If you even utter a word of asking, even to a man, like to anyone, you're in trouble. But if you pray to God, to any other God apart from the king, you're done. You're going into the lion's den. You're in trouble. You're finished. It's finito. That's scary. We have a cushy here sometimes. Like I've heard testimonies of people in other countries, and that's reality. And we find this easy to say, and we think we're going to be grand if that day ever comes. But I don't know if we will. I don't know if I would. I honestly don't know if I would. And so we get to this point where he is there and he has this really difficult choice to make. That he can pray and be faithful or he can choose not to. Not forever, for 30 days. Just 30 days. Just 30 days. And so we read in verses 10 to 11. Now, when Daniel had heard, learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the window opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went, to, went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. You see, in this, he chooses to be faithful. He chooses in that moment to lean in and to step into that moment step into relationship with God, stay in that place. He chose to be faithful despite everything. And you know what? He could have easily just not prayed for 30 days. Well, let's be real. Some of us would probably do that, like kind of, that'd be all right, right? It's a month. We'll survive. Imagine what the Daniel fast would have been if he chose not to fast, right? It'd be 30 days of no prayer. We'd all be jumping on that instead of eating our veggies, you know? <laughs> you know? Um, well, we see in this moment that he stands, he stays, he's faithful. And this is the key point in this, is that it was his private devotion that he put ahead of his public promotion. He cared more about his faithfulness to God than any fruitfulness in his life. The number one thing was the secret place. The number one thing was him sitting with the Lord, was sitting in the presence of God. And if all the other stuff comes, great, but that is not ahead. That is not ahead. My public faithfulness, my public devotion is always going to come ahead of all the promotion that I may see in my life. That's attention. Are we willing to let go of everything for him? Are we willing to let go of all of our job, all of the things we have, all the good things to remain faithful to him? That's a challenge. That's deep. That's hard. That is really hard. 
And here's the thing. If he just started praying that day, he would never have been faithful. He would never have. If he chose just you know, to, be, to be flippy floppy with the rest of his life, and then today, oh, I'm going to just be faithful on the day of trouble. It would never have happened. But it was because he was faithful in the, to the time before. He was faithful in the days where there was no storm, that in the day of the storm, he was faithful. In the day of the storm, he was there. In the day of the storm, he was ready and prepared. And my fear for all of us is that we're not prepared for the storm because in the easy days, we think we can just get by. And then when it comes to the hard day, we think that somehow we're just going to be okay and we're going to sit. You're not. You're going to run away. If you haven't built a life in God before anything comes, the day of the storm, you're not going to sit with him. You're just going to run around and try and fix it yourself. And this is what I love. Get to this. Get to this. This is beautiful. 80-year-old man. And it says every single day. The NLT talks about it and it says that that's what he did every single day. Every day he was found in this place. and, And we see that three times a day, three times. Not once, three times a day, he got on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. It was a habit, it was a routine, it was what he was always doing. He'd been doing it for years. He'd been doing it for years, and it was because he'd been doing it for years, he was ready for the storm. He was ready for that moment. He was ready to stand and be faithful, because he knew who Jesus was, because he knew who he was with, he knew who he was there for, and he knew who he was fighting for. If we don't know... Who we're supposed to be faithful to, we we can't just expect to be faithful. It's just not going to work. And let's look at the prayer. The prayer is powerful. And we find three things in this prayer, right? We find firstly that he's thankful. He he thanked God all the time. Or we have it backwards here, but he thanked God. He was on his knees and he was facing Jerusalem where he came from, looking to the place where he was originally from, looking to where he came from. And there's some powerful lessons in this. Because when we're here in exile, we're not from here. And when we're here, we can start feeling a lot like, this is where I'm from, this is where I am, and I just go with the flow. And so by Daniel spending three times a day, he was doing three things in that prayer, and three things, he was on his knees, in a spirit and in in a humble attitude, and saying to God, I'm submitted to your will. Yeah. I'm in reverence to you. You are my God. I am faithful to you and I submit to you. And that was the habit that he had built. And his soul had been formed because he had the habit and the practice of being on his knees, worshiping Jesus. He is the God. He's the one I serve. He's the one who I care about. He's the one who I just I trust. That's who my God is. Yeah. Also, he was 80 years old on his knees. I, I don't know. Like, I'm not 80, right? But I can imagine at 80, it hurts to go on your knees, you know? And he was faithful even in that, on his knees. And then we get that he was giving thanks. And there's something powerful in giving thanks. And we've all heard the gratitude sermons, right? And we, we love that. But, but, but think about this second, where Daniel was. Imagine that you're the person who was taken as a young boy, away from your home, away from your family, away from everything that you had, away from your God, away from, and you were, we heard in the week one about everything that happened to him. Yeah. I mean, the chap was castrated, like, that's, you know, all of this difficult, painful stuff that happened to him. And if, if, if I were in that situation, I'd be holding on to that pain for a long time. And I would be living my life as a victim, and I'd be living my life like, why did that happen to me? And some of us live a long time as a victim because of of what's happened in the past. And what I love about this is that he comes in battling against that victim mentality, battling against that, because when you're a victim, you can't be faithful, because you're just like, oh, I'll just let it happen. I'll just let it happen. And so he chooses to be thankful for the blessings he has in the exile. He chooses to be thankful in the place that's not his home. He chooses to be thankful even amongst everything that's going on. And as you build and form the habit of thankfulness, the habit of being grateful, it just starts killing the victim. It starts killing the pit of us. And and what does the victim do? It gives you a, a reason to sin. It gives you a reason not to be faithful. That's that voice. And it, it needs healing. It needs healing. But that voice of the victim, it comes up 
which I've experienced time after time again. And it just it says, oh, well, look, with everything that happened to you, you should just go on. You need that. I should don't worry about that. You've suffered enough. You don't need just just fly under the radar. You'll be grand. That's what the victim does. Being thankful reduces that. I'm blessed. Yeah. Stuff has happened, and I'm not negating that, but I am blessed. I'm thankful, Jesus. I'm so grateful for what you have done in my life. And God, I'm not going to live out of the problems and the burdens and the brokenness. I'm going to live out of the gratefulness of everything that you have done for me. And that's going to propel me to my faithfulness. That is what kept him faithful. And the third point, he was facing where he came from. He was facing the ruins of Jerusalem. He was facing the place where he was like, that is where my God dwells. That's where my God dwells. That is the, the place where I am from. That is the place that is home. That is the place where I ser- the God that I serve dwells. They are my people. That is who I am. That is who I am. And so every single day, he is coming on his knees three times a day, and he's remembering, I'm not from here. This is not who I am. I don't serve those foreign gods. I don't serve, I don't be faithful to the king above my God. I'm an Israelite. I'm a Jew. That is who I am. I'm from Jerusalem. And so when he's three times a day looking and remembering, he's faithful. He remembers that's who I am. And for us, we need to remember that we're not from here. We're not just the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And so we need to be sitting down and facing heaven where we come from every day and as we do that we're forming our lives to be into the reality that I am from heaven I come from him I'm set apart I'm a different person I'm from a different place and that I'm going to be faithful in this land even though it is not my homeland I am not from this earth I am from heaven I'm going to live like a citizen of heaven and we get so easily trapped we get so easily trapped in the idea that I, uh, and this is me. I live here and I'm just like everyone else. And I go to work like everyone else and I live life like everyone else. And I have to do the same things as everyone else. And you start feeling like the world around us. And so we slowly just compromise to fit in. And so we need a constant reminder that I am not from here. I am from heaven. I'm set apart. I'm different. And this is the whole area of formation. There's a whole conversation about spiritual formation in the church at the minute. And it's something we need to get right. Information alone isn't going to transform you. You can sit here, and this may sound counterintuitive, but you can sit here and listen to me, or listen to Pastor Sean, or listen to whoever, like for years, and not be transformed. Like, I'm, I'm not dissing preaching, it's important. But we change as we practice. We change as we do things. We change as we walk it out. And so we need to be constantly formed because you're either going to be formed into the world or formed into the image of God and you don't have an option. Like you're going to be formed into something. And so you you, you will naturally, if you're not doing anything, will form into the world because the air we breathe, there's there's something in it. There's advertising, there's media, there's all of this stuff that is making us go a certain way. And this title, this series is Against the Flow. We need to put practices in to be against the flow. Don't just listen to messages. Don't just come to church. Sit on your knees three times a day and remember who you are, where you came from, and adopt that habit. You need to be formed into the image of Jesus. That is your life. That's what God is. That's what Christianity is. It's becoming like Jesus, right? Doing what he did. That's what we need to be doing. So we need to be formed in his image. And so so we get to this and we see that this is why This is why he was faithful. This is what he was doing in order to be faithful. This is the whole reason why he was able to take the stand, because he'd been doing this. So don't get it wrong. The miracle did not start in the lion's den. We all want to run there. The miracle started in the 80 years before the the lion's den. The the, the miracle started in the 80 years of faithfulness. So then when the den came, he was ready. He was prepared for the miracle. Are we prepared for the miracle? Are we prepared to see God move? Are we prepared to see God come into our lives in that moment and transform us? Are we? I need to be faithful in the easy days so I can be faithful in the hard days. We need to. Anyway, I've dwelt on that. I've been pushing on that. And so we get to this 
this point right in the story where we see that he has been, he's been, been faithful and the faithfulness has led him to the lion's den where we all wanted to get. And we get here and we get into this the verse in verse uh, 16. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. A stone was brought, yeah, amen. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. And the king, listen to this, really important. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation may not be changed. So he's in there. Pretend you don't know what happens. We have no idea what's going to happen. All intents and purposes, he's dead. Yeah. Chap is dead. He's in the worst time of his life. The guards are watching there like, she's the poor chap. <laughs> Good luck to him. Jeez. They're probably expecting to see an arm fly up out of the den or something, you know, like the blood everywhere and expecting it to be rotten red. Not the case. We know that. But we miss the miracle because we just, we know the answer. We know what happens. But he's in there. And the presumption is he's dead. The presumption is he's dead. And then the king, which I, had a, I could do a whole sermon on the king, but we don't got time. <laughs> anyway, the king comes in verse 21 and says, or in verse 19, at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually be able to rescue you from the lions? I love the faith and expectation. Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me. Because why? Because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found in him because he trusted in God. He trusted in God. He was in that place and in that den, and in that den he came out spotless. Something happened in the den of trouble. Something happened in the the lion's den that he came out spotless and pure. And it was an angel of God who came in. The angel of God came in to his presence and took a place of death and made it a place of life. Took a place of brokenness and made it a place of, of healing and protection and life. It's amazing. It is absolutely phenomenal. And Matthew Henry, this commentator, has written a whole commentary on the Bible. And listen to this. this, Oh, man, when I read this. The angel's presence made even the lion's den his stronghold, his palace, his paradise. Listen to this. He had never had a a a better night in his life. The best night of his life in the lion's den. It's a great time. Sitting with an angel all night. Completely protected, completely safe, just enjoying the presence of heaven in that place that was supposed to be a place of death. I wonder, could our place of death be a place of life when we allow Jesus into it? I wonder, could be the place where we think we're going to die, could be the place of greatest intimacy and devotion with Jesus? I wonder, could the hospital bed be the place where you encounter God like you never have before? I wonder, could that deepest, darkest pain that you've been running away from, that when you allow Jesus into that, that that could be a time of the greatest renewal in life that you've ever experienced? Are we willing to let Jesus into the den? And I love this, is that one of the reasons that Daniel says that he was protected was because of his innocence. It's because of his innocence. And so, you know, immediately you run to the idea of, ah, sure, if I don't commit any sins, God's going to protect me. Bad theology. Bad theology. No. This whole thing is pointing to something greater than Daniel. It's pointing to something greater than this. Just The Old Testament is all pointing to a man who took our, who made us innocent, who made us pure, and it's not about our works. And I want you guys to see this and relive the story for a second with the perspective of Jesus. And so think about what happens is that Daniel is a man who was set up in a high place and everyone is applauding him and the crowds are around him and envy strikes. And it's because of that envy that he is taken as an innocent man and put to death. Does that sound familiar? Jesus, because of his, he was loved greater than all the Pharisees and everything, their envy led him to be brought 
to a king, to a leader who found him innocent. Pontius Pilate found him innocent. King Darius found Daniel innocent. But still, the people won. And he's sentenced to death. And here's the thing that's really interesting. And if you look at this, we said we talked about the seal. Do you remember the seal we talked about in the rock? And Daniel 6.17, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring. Matthew 27, verse 65. Look at this. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. There's relevance in the Old Testament. There's stuff that's foreshadowing Jesus. And so we get to the point where just as Daniel was in the den, in the tomb, sealed, shut, Jesus is put in the tomb, and the tomb is sealed, and the tomb is shut. Daniel was found innocent. Jesus goes into that tomb dead, even though he was an innocent man. He took on our sin. He took on our guilt. He took on our shame. He took all of that stuff into the tomb with him. And he took on our death. And here's the thing. Is that that tomb that was supposed to be the place where he's dead dead was the place where he came alive. It was the place where he became alive and became someone who was who's alive and, and resurrected and the power of God was all over the thing. And here's the thing, is that, and this is what I want you to get now, is that as you walk into wherever you're going, into the tomb, into the shame, into whatever, and you're afraid, and the voice comes in to say, I'm not going to be protected because I've not been good enough. I'm not going to be protected. God's not on my side because I've sinned, because I'm guilty, because my conscience isn't clean. We know what that's like. But as we walk into whatever tomb, what into ever den we face, what into any suffering, what into ever trial that we go into, we walk into knowing that someone has gone before us, that we go in and that we should go in and we should be eaten by the lions straight away. You should die. You should be eaten by the lions. You shouldn't have any protection in God, but it's because Jesus came in before you and he took the appetite of the lions away from you. He went in and he put on the smell of your sin and the smell of your rebellion and the scent of your, your dirt and filth and all of that shame. And he goes into the lions then on your behalf and he is, allows himself to die for you. Amen. He allows himself to die for you so that when you walk into the tomb, you're safe and you're protected by him. There's nothing going to touch you. You're surrounded because you're innocent in his eyes. He's got you. He's for you. He's surrounding you. You're safe. Psalm 91 is the thing that got me into the kingdom of God. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Lord will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Next one. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And we might get the worship team up. He will, they will lift you up in their hands that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. It's finished. You don't need to be afraid anymore. You don't need to be worrying about death. You don't need to be worrying about all those fears that you have. He holds you in the palm of his hand. You're sheltered and protected. And even if you do die, if something comes and you die, you're not dead. You're alive in him. You experience the resurrection. You need to be living that we're going home when these things happen. And so for us today, practically, I'd love if we could be walking out of here with no fear, with no shame, with no guilt, that today God wants to free you from all of those things. He wants to free you so you can walk as an innocent person, protected and safe. And so I'd encourage you, if you have never committed your life to God before, if you've never experienced the sweetness of being like, my conscience is clear, Jesus has paid my debt, and I can walk away from fear. Today is your option. And so if you have never made that decision, even right now, I'd love for you just to, just to raise your hand. Maybe it's recommitting to say, Jesus. If you would repeat after me, Jesus, I choose to believe in you. 
I thank you that you died on the cross. You took my place. You took my shame. And you took my guilt. And today I stand as an innocent man. And I can walk in your freedom and the new life found in your resurrection. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.